So I'm going to talk about um, some work in the in differential privacy, as Raghu mentioned, and let me get started. So <clears throat> you know, many of us have uh, smartphones, and we rely on nice features like, say, autocomplete or automatic spell correction. Um, and <clears throat> you know, how does how does all this stuff work? Well, you know, um, I'm not a machine learning expert, but uh, I know that, and you all probably know that that gets used, which means that the 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 server, whoever's running uh, the operating system, needs to, or the app, needs to, like basically learn from our data. So you can imagine this cartoon example: there are end devices and and smartphones. Each one has some data, like the last word you texted. And say, for example, the server wants to know the word distribution amongst devices. So there's a histogram f. F sub x is how many devices just texted the word x. Okay. So simple, right? Each device sends a copy of all its text messages to the server, and the server knows everything and can answer questions like this. Uh, but there's a constraint, privacy. Do you really want whoever is designing these apps or making these phones to be able to read all your text messages? Probably not. So the basic idea is to send randomized messages and add noise. Actually, I'm just show of hands, like who here works in privacy or knows anything about differential privacy? OK, who doesn't? OK, there are some who don't, so that's OK. So, uh, brief uh, crash course. So here's the here's a picture. This is, this is actually bogus. Okay, <laughs> this, is, this is not really how it works, but and we'll see why it's bogus and we'll see how it should work. But for example, let's say my text message is an image. So me at my the baby shower for my first child, um, you know, and people are passing around this funny this uh, image around via text, and <clears throat> you know you, you will send when you text your friend this image you will do you will text them the true image. But to the server, you're not going to send the true image. You're going to send some noisified, randomized version of it, where maybe you add some static, or maybe you add a whole lot of oops, you add a whole lot of static. Like, this is not exact. This is not at all how, how anything works. But uh, this is just where, you know. I'll, I'll get into how things work soon. And the idea is that um, you know we don't just have one person with a smartphone. We have millions of people out there in the world with smartphones. And maybe want to know, like, did this particular image of Jelani, of me drinking from a bottle go viral or not? So we look at our million devices. Each one is sending some message. Some of them are sending the message of me with a bottle. Some of them are sending a picture of a cat or whatever else they're sending. And we just want the server to somehow aggregate all these noisified, randomized messages and be able to extract knowledge from the aggregate. So in particular, it would be nice if the server can say, oh, this is approximately an image that many people are sending, although I can't identify which people are sending this image. Okay, so that's the that's the kind of goal that we would be happy to see. Uh, so the moral of what we want is, you know, have each individual message look like random garbage to the server, thus protecting individual privacy, but the server can still extract useful knowledge from the aggregate without being able to identify anything about a particular person. Um, but what exactly does privacy mean? Does adding static like I showed you actually give what you want? And probably not because, I mean, this is a real thing that I did. I, I, ran, I, I took that image of me with a bottle. I heavily noisified it. And then I ran it through some Python library that has wavelet denoising uh, as you know, some implemented algorithm. And it's, it spat that out. Okay, and this is concerning because what I said was, you don't want to learn anything about any individual. You should only learn in the aggregate. But this is only one individual message, and from that one individual message, this wavelet denoising, whatever it is, learn quite a lot, right? And look, you can kind of tell that it's a person drinking something. You shouldn't be able to do that kind of stuff. So, we have to be careful with the definition and come up with mechanisms that you know make sure the definition makes sense, and then like have algorithms that actually provably satisfy the definition. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to use local differential privacy, which is not something I invented. Um, the, the idea is going to be what you saw: that the device I sends some random message m sub i that is only weakly correlated with its data. Its its data is x sub i. X sub i could be the picture of me with a bottle. It could be a picture of a cat. Whatever the message was, and one individual's device should look like random noise almost, but such that the server can extract signal in the aggregate. And the privacy definition we use is the standard one that's kind of the gold standard now, which is uh, differential privacy, which was uh, introduced by Jork McSherry and Seaman Smith in 06. And for our scenario, this is what it means. For the local model, this is what it means. 
So if for every device I, so for every user, and all possible messages M that a device could send, and for all different d data elements, X and X prime. So X could be a picture of a cat, or it could be a picture of me, right? Whatever, it's, it's some data that one user has. The probability that, that, that the ith device sends M as its message, given that it has a picture of me, compared with the probability that it sends the same message, given that it has a picture of a cat, the, the ratio of these probabilities should be close to 1. It should be bounded by some e to the epsilon. So if you think for a moment, um, <clears throat> for those in the room who, haven't, who said they haven't seen differential privacy at all before, if epsilon equals 0, then e to the 0 is 1. So you're saying the ratio is at most 1. But I could change who I call x and who I call x prime, which means the inverse ratio is also at most 1, which means it equals 1. What does that mean? It means that the problem that you send this message is the same no matter what your data is. So it doesn't depend on your data at all, right? So <clears throat> you might as well just send some random noise, period, independent of your data. Well, intuitively, that, that means that you're perfectly private, because nothing you've sent is related to your data in any way. So we call this epsilon the privacy loss. And as you just saw, when epsilon is 0, you, e to the 0 is 1. You've lost no privacy. This is perfectly private. So epsilon equals 0 is uh, perfectly private. Similarly, you can think epsilon equals infinity is like uh, not private at all. I can just send my data in the clear, for example. <clears throat> um, so this is, this is the mathematical formulation we're going to use to talk about algorithms that maintain privacy. OK, so for those of you who said you've never seen privacy before, do you have a question about? Because if you don't understand the definition, then the rest of the talk is going to be very painful. So. OK, uh, oops. OK, so two regimes to keep in mind. Um, one is small epsilon, so epsilon is 0.01. And then e to the epsilon is roughly 1 plus epsilon by Taylor approximation, which means that these probabilities are very close together. Uh, the other is large epsilon. And by large, I mean like 5 or 10. I don't mean a million. Um, and from what I understand, it's what's usually deployed in practice. And large epsilon means worse privacy, right? It's the privacy loss. So why would you deploy large epsilon? That sounds, that sounds uh, not what you want. Um, <clears throat> well, the first thing to keep in mind is if you go back to the first two slides I had with like automatic spell correction and autocomplete on your smartphone, right? You know, uh, a good reason to want to share data is because it allows the company to provide you better, pro a better product. Right? Like, I enjoy having, I, I, I appreciate having a better quality autocomplete and automatic spell correction, right? Which, <clears throat> so um, the more knowledge that I allow the server to extract from my data and all the other users' data, like the better quality product that will translate to into the future. So on the one hand, I as a user appreciate that. On the other hand, I as a user care about my privacy too. So these two things are attention. Even me as a user, I kind of want both. I do want, you know, maybe I do want you to share, know a little bit about my data so you can train your ML models. Um, so there's this fundamental trade-off between the utility, which is the quality of the knowledge the server can extract, and the privacy, which is this privacy loss parameter. Um, so, you know, from the perspective of whoever's making the product, whoever's making the automatic spell correction, they would love to just know your data in the clear without any privacy, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so then, you know, the, the question is like, how, how little privacy can I give you so that you're happy? Um, but there's a silver lining here. One, okay, the first thing I want to say is that in, in some of the problems we're going to consider today and other problems, if you insist that epsilon is super small, like 0.01, the utility is so bad that you know the the automatic spell correction is going to be crappy. Okay. But the silver lining is that there's something you can do called shuffling which automatically improves privacy. And I'm not going to say anything more than it about what you see right here, but um, basically it's a different model that's related to the local model. But what, you know, what these theorems say is if you design a protocol for the local model and prove that your protocol satisfies epsilon equals 6, let's say, and then you just take that protocol and deploy it in a slightly different model, then epsilon kind of automatically improves as the number of users grows. Okay, so if you have if you do have a million users, then actually 
your real epsilon in the new model is actually 0.01 or whatever. Uh, I'm slightly cheating. There's a difference between pure and approximate DP, whatever. But this is roughly what it says. So it's kind of you know using this, it's kosher to develop algorithms with epsilon being five or six, and then deploy them in this alternate model. Okay. So here, uh, sorry, shuffling just means like forgetting whose data is whose. Yeah, but is okay. there, yeah. There's like someone who sits in the middle. Yeah. Who who receives all the messages? Yeah. And then randomly permutes them and then forwards them on. So is there, I mean, just an informal statement you're going to make about what does epsilon improve to? Like, yeah, I think it's something like e to the epsilon over root n, something okay. like that, right. where n is the number of devices. And there's also some dependence on <laughs> that becomes the new epsilon. Becomes, yeah, that? the old if the old epsilon is epsilon, the new epsilon is e to the epsilon over root n. Okay. So you can think like if epsilon is five, yeah. e to the epsilon is 150. Okay. But if n is a million, then you've saved something. Okay. Okay. So good. So I'm going to talk about two problems today. The first one is histogram estimation. So remember, the, I, I, at some point I had some graphic where I said there are n devices. Each one has a data element. And then there's a histogram. f sub x is the number of devices whose data is x. Okay. So, so that's the problem. The problem is like each device sends a randomized message to the server. The server wants to estimate this histogram, this vector of counts. And we're gonna, you know, if you say estimate the histogram, it's not going to be perfect reconstruction. There's going to be error. We're going to measure the error as the L2 distance, specifically this average distance squared between the true count and our estimated count. F tilde is the estimated histogram. Okay. <clears throat> and now we're putting on the hat of algorithm designers. So uh, what, you know, when you're designing the algorithm, what are the things you're trying to optimize? So there, I'm going to put five things down on this slide. For each one of them, you can imagine that if you fix all the other four, ideally the fifth should be as small as possible. So you know, there's the privacy loss epsilon. The smaller, the better. There's the utility loss, which is the mean squared error, which is this average squared uh, L2 norm. There's, <clears throat> there's uh, the communication, right? So each device has to send bits, send a message to the server that takes some number of bits. Ideally, I want those messages to be short to be communication efficient. And there's runtime. There's the time it takes the server to take all the messages and run some algorithm on them to extract the answer. But there's also the device runtime, which is I'm a device with my data. I have to generate this randomized message. I want that to be fast. Okay. So ideally, you want all five to be small simultaneously, but maybe there are some trade-offs, and you want to understand the trade-off space. So. Um, <clears throat> Before I tell you kind of what we did, I'll just say a little bit about some simple examples of what was already out there. There, there are other, other examples that I'm not going to get into that are a little bit less simple. But an old one is randomized response. What is randomized response? Each device sends its true item x. So the domain is of size k. We imagine that all messages are just, say, integers from 1 to k. So we have a domain of size k. So each device sends its true item x with probability e to the epsilon p. Epsilon is this privacy loss parameter, so you have to know what privacy loss you want. Otherwise, you send a uniformly random other item such that each other item has probability p of being sent. So what is p? There's only one value of p where this makes any sense, because you will send something. The probability you send something is 1. But the probability that you send something is e to the epsilon p for the true item. And for all the other items in the universe, I said it's p. So that sum has to be 1, which means p is determined. Okay. And then how does the server then estimate the frequency of x? You use some unbiased linear estimator. So what do I mean by that? For each message mi, so let's say I'm trying to estimate for a specific x, how many devices do I think hold x? So for each message mi that I get from the ith device, if that message equals x, I add alpha plus beta to a counter. If it doesn't equal x, I only add beta. If xi does equal x, okay, notice I always add the beta, right? So no matter what, I always add the beta. If xi does equal x, What's the probability that I also add the alpha? It's e to the epsilon p. And when, it's the, when I do add it, there's an alpha there. So that's the expected contribution of this counter <clears throat> when xi actually does equal x. And when it doesn't equal x, this e to the epsilon p becomes p, right? So now, if I want, you know, a natural thing to do is choose the coefficients alpha and beta so that this is unbiased, which means I want the first thing to be 1 and I want the second thing to be 0. So I solve for alpha and beta and I get something. So at this point, this is a full scheme. I've told you exactly what the devices do. I've told you exactly what the server will do to estimate the counts. So now you ask, is it good? The, <clears throat> without giving specific uh, 
quantities, well, the, the pros are that it's low communication. There's basically no communication overhead. Normally, if I were to send my data in the clear, it'd be log k bits. It's an element in a domain of size k, it'd be log k bits. I'm still sending an element in a domain of size k, so it's still log k bits. And the device time is you know, constant, right? In some, in some reasonable model of computation, word RAM or whatever, and the server runtime is also linear, right? So for the server, <clears throat> the server will just initialize this histogram to all zeros, and it'll add beta times n to every single counter, because <clears throat> um, you always add beta for everything. And then for each message, it'll add the alpha to the appropriate bucket. So it's linear time. The con, which I'm not going to show you here, just trust me, the con is that the mean squared error is terrible. Remember, the thing we cared about is like accurate reconstruction. What's the L2 norm between f and f tilde? The expectation of that is actually quite bad if you do the calculation. OK, so that's that scheme. Great in communication and speed, bad in terms of utility. Another simple. All right, so for the utility loss, yeah. I mean, here, I mean, the main issue is just the variance of the. Yeah, it's the variance. Okay. Bad, yeah. But I'm thinking of e to the epsilon as the bad thing, or I'm thinking about k, like, so the loss and variance, which is so the. So if you think epsilon is like five, yeah. e to the epsilon is 150, yeah. and then k is like the size of the dictionary. Ah, okay. okay. Right, gotcha. so k is huge, yeah. and is also quite big. Yeah. And is the so k is one of the biggest problems. k is really big, right? yeah. Right, and, and basically, what the, the, if you look at the utility loss, it's going to be like k times something. Yeah. So my is, statistical, like my uh, sample complexity, get the same accuracy, you know, increases based on the dictionary size. Or say, say, it, say it again, say it again. I mean, could you think of this as like this, you know, sample complexity to get a good estimate of the underlying distribution as like growing? Yeah, maybe that's, okay. Um, okay. yeah. But yeah, if, okay. if k were small, this wouldn't be so bad. If k were 2, this wouldn't be bad. This would not be bad. OK. Another simple scheme is subset selection, which is um, <clears throat> each device. OK, so now you pick D to be some integer. Each device sends a random subset of the domain of size D. Now the question, so there are basically uh, K choose D different messages that could be sent. So I have to assign probabilities to each one. So how am I going to do that? If my, tr if my item is in S, I'll assign probability E to the epsilon P to S. If my item is not an S, I'll assign probability P. Again, there's only one value of P that makes sense because the probability that I send something is 1. There are k minus 1, choose d minus 1 that do contain. There are k minus 1, choose d that don't, blah, blah, blah. I get P. So this is, this, this is what I do on the device side. On the server side, I do something similar to last time. For each message, the message is a set. If the set contains x, I'll add alpha plus beta. If it doesn't contain x, I'll only add beta. I'm trying to figure out, do I think this message is a vote for x or not? So this is how I determine whether it's a vote for x or not. Um, and you can write, if xi were x, what would the expected, expected contribution be, if, as opposed to if it weren't? Solve some linear system. Um, it tells you what alpha and beta should be. Alpha and beta will be functions of k and d and epsilon. Okay. <clears throat> and the point is, d was a free parameter this whole time. Remember, if d were 1, if d is 1, this is randomized response. OK, but d is a free parameter. So now that I have some kind of expression, algebraic expression for the mean squared error, the variance, I can choose d to optimize it. And basically, the best d you should pick is an integer that's close to this, k over e to the epsilon plus 1. So that your communication is terrible. Exactly, right. So as you said, the cons, terrible communication because you're basically, think of e to the epsilon is 100, 150. You're sending 1% of the entire domain as your message. And the domain is huge. The message, you know, so, uh, and, and because all these messages are ginormous, your, your run times are also going to be really slow, too, because you're passing around these huge messages and operating these huge messages. The, the pro is that <clears throat> Ian Barg showed that for a given epsilon, this scheme gets the optimal, maybe up to 1 plus little o of 1 the optimal utility loss. Not even, not just big O, not up to a constant factor, but up to, you know, one plus little o of one, okay? So in terms of utility loss, this is kind of the gold standard we're going to try to match. Okay, it's but we want to be efficient. Paper, right? Huh? It's the same paper. Oh, yeah, sorry. This, I don't know why I said it was six. It's the same, yeah, it's, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I need to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Improve their lower bound. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so let me first say a meta approach, which uh, 
There's another algorithm called Hadamard response. I'm not going to talk about how it works, but one thing you can extract from that paper that introduced Hadamard response is what I'll call a meta approach, which is um, let's just say there's an arbitrary, there's a message space. Okay, so be, you know, in, the, in, ra in uh, subset selection, the message space was all subsets of size D. In randomized response, it was the domain itself. But like, let's just say there's some message space. I can, I'm free to choose it as the algorithm designer. And um, let's, do some, like, let's introduce some combinatorial design. So, <clears throat> um, so we're going to, for each element of the domain, 1 to k, we're going to associate with it a subset of message space. So for every x, I'm going to associate with it s sub x, which is a subset of message space. And all the s sub x's have the same exact size, a little s. And they're a design, meaning that for different domain elements, their intersection sizes of their, of their s sets are, are exactly the same. I'm going to call these s's the preferred message list. So s sub x is the preferred message list for x. The mechanism is going to be similar to before. For a given x, if a set is a preferred message, I send it with probability e to the epsilon p. If it's not a preferred message, I send it with probability p. OK. And again, you can solve for p. <clears throat> um, there's only one value of p where this makes sense, where the probability that you send a message is 1. And how are you going to estimate the number of occurrences of x? Similar to before, for every message, you'll only add the alpha of the message as a vote for x, if the message is preferred for x. You always add the beta. And then you do the same tricks about solving for alpha and beta so it's an unbiased estimator. And then you, you get basically some linear equations. You solve them. You have alpha and beta. OK. Now, uh, the next slide is just uh, to show you that you can do some very concrete calculations. They're not too hard. But you do some variance calculation, voila. OK. And the variance, when you, it has two terms. The one that I'm going to focus on that turns out to be the dominant term is the one in blue. And the punchline is that if you look at this thing in blue, this is the utility loss. This is the error. There's a y over s, which is the ratio between the, the number of messages that exist divided by the size of the mes preferred message list for any one user or for any one domain element. And there's also l over s, which is the intersection size between two different preferred message lists divided by the size of the message list. And the, the mean squared error increases as both of those increase. So you want these small. You also want y itself to be small. Just to be clear, why do you, so let me quiz you. Why do you want y to be small? Yeah. Communication, right? Your communication is log y bits, right? So you also want y to be small. OK. And if you, if you, if you think about, if you, if you now with this kind of general expression, if you go back to, if you go back to um, like uh, subset selection and ask, like, why was it so good? Basically, the reason it's so good is that the L and the S work out to exactly cancel this, and the Y over S also equals this, and it just that turns out to be, I guess, the optimal thing to happen. Okay, and that's what Ian Barge told us. Oh yeah. Like, is this a de-randomization of the subset selection scheme where you were randomly choosing subsets? Yeah. Now you are, you have subsets that have this property of design, like any two have intersections oh. of size L. Yeah. Like, which is like a random, like, like uh -huh. sort of equidistant. Right. Uh, think and therefore, like those are sufficient to do this proof calculations. Right. I mean, okay. So there, but there, yeah. So although they are, they are subsets of different things. Like in subset selection, the messages were subsets of the domain. Right. Here, there's some arbitrary message space I created, and you just want like some kind of de combinatorial design on that. Um, but but it is true that. Uh, people have taken the pseudo-randomness lens on subset selection and come up with something. So for example, there was a paper by, uh, before, before our work by Vitaly Feldman and Kunal Talwar that kind of used pairwise independence to design some kind of scheme that was good. Although it, was, it, was, it, it, it achieved basically the same optimal error as um, subset selection. And it was faster, but not as fast as what I'm going to show you today. But yeah, but they're similar, I guess. But yeah, the, the name of the game now is just make a very good, you know, make a good combinatorial design, right? Where I, you know, it, it should come, it should, it should optimize these parameters, and it should also come with an algorithm that's fast. Okay. So you know, you think, you think, and you don't know what to do. So at some point, maybe you pray. Okay. 
Um, and then uh, you pray long enough, and then uh, you realize that actually God is trying to tell you something, okay, which is that uh, you should use projective geometry. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, by the way, I didn't, you know, I, 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 as, a, as a child, I learned that the Renaissance was this great thing. I didn't fully understand how much math was involved in Renaissance art, but now I understand a little bit more. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, so so what, what God is trying to tell us is that you should pick a prime Q and define the message space to be FQ to the T, okay, uh, where you pick T large enough so that the message space has size that's at least the domain size. So, which means there's some injection. You can create whatever injection you want between the domain and FQ to the T. So you can treat every element in the domain as a t-dimensional vector in FQ. And what we're going to do is we're going to define the preferred messages <coughs> uh, as being the t minus one dimensional subspace orthogonal to x. So any u such that x dot u is zero mod q, and then Sx intersect Sy. Right, is a t minus two dimensional subspace. So that tells us exactly what S and L are. So I want these things to be one over Q. I set Q to be the closest prime to e to the epsilon minus one, and voila, I have, I have uh, a scheme. Okay. I'll, okay, but there's a minor bug, and the minor bug is, okay, like look at what if X is this element of FQ to the T, and Y is this element of FQ to the T, then the subsets are the same subset, right? So SX and SY are the same. Their intersection is not a t minus two dimensional subspace. It's, a t, it's still a t minus one dimensional subspace. So you fix that with projective geometry. So what does that mean? The projective points in FQ to the T are the non-zero vectors in FQ to the T who, as you go from left to right, let's say, the first non-zero you encounter has to be a one. So basically you just, everyone who's on the, every, all points on the same line through the origin, you treat as the same point. So these are the projective points. And then now, it's not hard to show, count the number of projective points, it's that. And then you pick T large enough so you can identify the domain with projective uh, points. And the preferred set now is the projective subspace orthogonal to X. That is all projective points U such that X dot U is zero mod Q. And you can compute S and L and you set them nicely and everything works, okay? So that's that. Um, and you know, here's a table with uh, some of the prior works compared to the new scheme. So maybe what I'll show you is like subset selection has this utility loss, which is the optimal utility loss, four times n times you know blah 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 blah, and that's exactly also what we get. But whereas before the runtime was n times k, and the communication was also like k, our communication is log k, and our runtime is linear. It's like n plus k times some stuff. Okay. Um, I, I should also mention that there were other works before. That also got f even faster, actually, runtime. They didn't have an e to the epsilon multiplying the runtime. They also had great communication, but they sacrificed constant factors in their utility loss. Okay, so instead of four, one got eight and one got 36. And maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll pause to say something about that. You could say, well, many of us in this room are, come from the theory CS community, and we, we, we've gotten the, into the habit of ignoring constant factors. So if you say, well, Jelani, if you put big O's on everything, these two rows look strictly better than this row. So like, who cares, right? Um, so one thing that I'll say about that is, uh, and actually when I first started working on this project, it's something that had to be told to me over and over again because I, I didn't, I, I was one of those people who said, who cares? Um, so when you have a slow algorithm, like when I say slow, let's say you have an algorithm that doesn't get the right constant factor in the big O notation. If it's parallelizable, you'll say, well, I'll just I'll throw more machines at it. Or maybe you know, next year my computer will get faster or whatever. Here, the utility loss is a property of the algorithm, right? And no matter how many, no matter how many, how much computational power you throw at it, it's not going to improve your utility loss, right? And at the end of the day, you want the really good, you know, autocomplete, spell correction, whatever that you're using with your ML models. So you you, you know. <clears throat> I'm not in that community, but I think people in the ML community, they care a lot about performance, but performance is like generalization error, right? And like accuracy. And you know, if you tell them, well, I can double or multiply by nine your, your error rates, they're not gonna be happy. Okay, uh, yes. So are the utility loss and Hadamard response the constant state? Yeah, I, fe I feel, because you know, we did, I'm gonna show you some slides. We did some experiments, 
And in, in, in our experiments, this 36 was not really 36. So I, it probably, is, but it was definitely not four. It was, it was close, it, this RHR and HR actually behaved quite similarly to each other. Maybe I'll just show you some pictures. Um, so uh, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just say like, okay, so what are these? Basically what we did was, we, the y-axis is the mean squared error, and what we did was, you know, these are randomized algorithms, which means the error you get is a random variable. If you run the same algorithm multiple times, you'll get different errors. So we just, we pretended that we had n users. We pretended to run, uh, you know, one of these algorithms, like randomized response or whatever. All these n fake users sent their messages to the server, who then ran the reconstruction algorithm and came up with an F tilde, and we measured the mean, we measured the error. We measured the L2 squared error. And we did it again, and we did it again, we did it again, we did it a thousand times, or whatever. And what you're seeing plotted here is the empirical CDF of the error. Okay, so each color was a different algorithm that we tried out. Green HR is Hadamard response. RHR is recursive Hadamard response. So in the, in the theory, this had an error of eight times something. This had an error of 36 times something. So I guess here there actually was a gap. And then uh, subset selection, which we know is optimal theoretically, is the dark blue. And our algorithm is the light blue. Okay. Why is the light blue briefly better than the dark blue? I don't know. I mean, so when we say that subset selection is optimal, we mean the expected mean squared error, right? It doesn't say anything about the distribution. And actually, you know, the medians are kind of right on top of each other. So I guess the, yeah, they have, they have the same expectation, but the actual distribution doesn't look the same for whatever reason. And I don't know why. Um, but, you know, and so we had different kinds of data. We had Zipfian data with different decay rates. We had spike data where one, you know, one domain element is a, there a lot, et cetera. Actually, this, this is measuring max error instead of mean squared error, but whatever. This is means, this is, uh, anyway. So we have a bunch of different plots. Um, the yellow one, there's a very, you know, so we do have to suffer in our runtime by multiplying by e to the epsilon compared to Hadamard response, which doesn't have that. But we do have a variant of our algorithm where you can kind of trade off this multiplier if you're willing to sacrifice some utility loss. So let's say I'm willing, you know, I don't insist on having four times n e to the epsilon. I'm okay with five times n e to the epsilon. If I'm okay with that, I can actually recover some fa a little bit faster runtime. So that's our yellow curve is like, you know, running, trading off, worsening the utility loss a little bit to get speed. Um, and in terms of speed, you know, so here are a few algorithms. Um, PG is our algorithm. HPG3 is worsening our um, four to six, I think, in the constant. And then pi rapport was the previous state of the art algorithm that used the pseudo randomness that uh, lens uh, and, and tried, you know, matched the utility loss of subset selection and was faster than subset selection, but still not incredibly fast. So on some, you know, on some input settings, um, pi report took about half an hour. Our algorithm took about 37 seconds. If you're willing to, if you're willing to, um, oh, this is on the server side. If you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of utility loss, it became six seconds versus, you know, RHR and HR, which were like a second to half a second. And then randomized response is was super fast, uh, but it's also really ina it's also really bad utility loss. Okay. Um, so how do you make our scheme fast? Um, I'll say something briefly here. It's basically to use dynamic programming. Okay. And why is it dynamic programming? So this is the thing that you wanted to measure, right? So for any X, you, you know, for every device, you add a beta. You only add the alpha when the message is a preferred message. So let me rewrite this. Um, you, you always add the beta, so there's a beta N. And then there's an alpha times how many messages are preferred messages. Okay, and let me re rewrite that. What is a preferred message? A preferred message is a u such that x dot u is zero mod q. It's a, it's a projective point u such that x dot zero is u mod q. So let's make a new histogram y, where y sub u is the number of, me number of times u was sent as a message. Right? So basically, we can rewrite the sum and say, you know, for, you know let's group Let's group the terms by the messages being the same, and then check is that message actually a preferred message or not. So let's sum over all u such that u is a preferred message, x dot u is zero mod q. What, and how many times did we get that message? Y sub u times alpha. 
So this, we don't need any dynamic programming for that. We need it for like computing this internal sum. So naively, computing that sum would take something like k over q time per x, right? Because for every, for, so there, let's say the domain size is k. You can show that the number of preferred messages, the number of elements of message space that are preferred for x is k over q. So the number of summands here is k over q. So just naively just do a loop. Do a loop of, of length k over q and sum this all up. Do that for each domain element. You would get a runtime of k squared over q. So it would be quadratic. k is big. So I don't like that. Um, the, the fast, a faster thing you could do is dynamic programming. Um, and maybe I, I don't know, okay, let me, I'll just skip this part because there's not, I mean, uh, it's not, it's pretty vanilla dynamic programming. Now that I've told you what you have to compute, if you went home and thought about it for, you know, give it to your undergrads in your undergrad algorithms course, they'd be able to figure it out, okay? And the punchline, there's one trick where if you do the, if you do the DP too naively, and it's not DP meaning dynamic programming, not differential privacy, um, You'll get extra factors of Q in both your time and space, but there's an optimization you can realize to get rid of them. And you're going to end up with something like K memory and KQT time. T is log base Q of K. Okay, it's the dimension of these vectors. And Q is the size of the prime, which is E to the epsilon. Okay, and it's implementable and it's actually implemented. Um, and I mentioned, as I mentioned, you can trade off utility for time, but let me skip this. Uh, one more problem that I want to say in the last maybe 14 minutes is mean estimation, which again is a similar kind of setup. We're going to do it in the local model. There's a server. Now we're doing like this federated learning, right? So in federated learning, the idea is that <clears throat> the server is trying to learn some parameter theta, which is some d-dimensional vector of an ML model, like weights in a neural network or something. And uh, every, you know, every user has its own data and can compute, let's say, a gradient based on its own data. And then the server wants to estimate the average gradient and do a, do a step in some iterative algorithm, like gradient descent or something. OK. Um, yeah, so again, we're in the local model. Data is not centrally located. I already talked about federated learning. So you can say each device has a local gradient based on a current iterate. And the server wants to compute the mean gradient for, to do a step. Um, so in the central model, if you want to compute like the average of a bunch of vectors, it's easy. You just the server will, has all the vectors, adds them, and adds noise at the end. But in the local model, it's not as clear what you should do. Um, yeah. So I guess this is just you know some ML paper that does federated learning. What does it say? What says what I said, when training ML models in the federated setting, clients do not send their local data to a central server. Instead, a central aggregator coordinates an optimization procedure among the clients. Uh, at each iteration of the procedure, clients compute gradient-based updates to the current model, and they communicate only these updates to a central aggregator. Right? So that's exactly what I was talking about. But we want to send, the, we want to send that local update to the server privately okay, to preserve privacy. Um, so let me just skip some of these. So the second problem for today is each device holds a vector x sub i and rd. So that's the mean would be the, the mean. The server wants to estimate some approximate mean that's close to the true mean. So I want, the, let's say, small L2 norm, or small L2 squared. Um, so you know, a, a simple thing you could imagine is that each user would just add a bunch of noise locally to its vector. And then send send this all to the to the server, and the server can add it all up. Uh, that would satisfy local privacy, but you get bad utility, and the communication turns out to be larger than you would want. So let me just tell you a little bit about what was out there before, and what's what did how did we you know try to contribute. So uh, there were a couple algorithms out there. One by Ducci, Jordan, and Wainwright, and there's also one by Bomek et al. called PrivUnit. And both of them had expected error, which was d over n times the min of epsilon and epsilon squared, in this L2 expectation of the L2 squared of the difference. And Ducci and Rogers showed that this kind of error is, optim is asymptotically optimal. And in fact, not only is it asymptotically optimal, but Hillal, Feldman, or I should not say Hillal, Ossie, Feldman, and Talwar showed that priv unit actually is the optimal algorithm. Like, not even. Um, 
it's not even optimal in like the one plus little o of one sense. It's optimal in the sense of any other algorithm, any other unbiased estimator, any other algorithm which produces an unbiased estimator for this problem has expected error, which is greater than or equal to the previewed error. So it's kind of optimal in the best, hope, best sense you could hope for amongst unbiased estimators. So what is this priv unit thing anyway? <clears throat> um, so let's say it's parameterized. There's a parameter p and a parameter gamma, and then your input is x. So I'm a device holding a d-dimensional vector x. Uh, and the first thing I'll do is I'll select a, ran a uniformly random point on the sphere w. With probability p, I'll output alpha times w. <clears throat> um, I'll sample from the following distribution. Sample a uniformly random point on the sphere conditioned on the event that w dot x is at least gamma, and then basically output w, scale, some scaled version of w. Otherwise, with probability 1 minus p, I'll condition on the event that w dot x is less than gamma, and then output w, or some scaled version of w. You can kind of think of this as like some continuous randomized response on the sphere, right? So like with some probability p, so let, let, let's kind of change the way that it's phrased a little bit. With some probability p, I'll send a random point on the sphere that's close to x. Right? In randomized response, you actually send x. So with, with some probability p, I'll send a random point on the sphere that's close to x. Otherwise, I'll send just a uniformly random point on the sphere. Right? So it's, it, it's in that way, it's like randomized response. Um, and you know, when I say that they showed that preview unit is optimal, it's optimal if you choose gamma and p the right way. OK. But that can be done. <clears throat> so why is there room for, for improvement? So you can sample such v in, in linear time, but communicating this v, it's a d-dimensional vector. You know, this w, oh yeah, v is the scale version of w. It's a, it's a d-dimensional vector. It's a real vector. It's going to take at least d bits. And you can say, well, you know, just like in randomized response, there's no overhead. Like my, my input is a d-dimensional vector. I'm sending a d-dimensional vector. It turns out that you can actually do better. You can send sublinear communication and achieve the same kind of error. Um, another thing you could do, and actually I'll, I'll explain that right now. Another thing you could, a, a version of priv unit that also works is to generate v using a pseudorandom generator with small seed length. OK, so what do I mean by that? <clears throat> um, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to actually send v or w. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick some kind of PRG that lets me select as a pseudo-random point on the sphere. And let's say that first I'm going to flip my biased coin to tell whether I'm in the p case or the 1 minus p case. Let's say that I'm in the p case, OK? Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pick a uniformly random seed, feed it into my PRG, and check, did my PRG give me did it give me a w that is in this conditional case? It did? Great. I'll send alpha times w. It didn't? Try again. So basically, you do kind of rejection sampling until you get a nice w. And so the PRG's twist doesn't actually change the privacy guarantees? Uh... It does not change the privacy okay. guarantee. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. Alpha is normal. No, alpha is some normalization constant that will depend on, oh, the norm of x? So right now, I'm just assuming x is in the sphere. X, is, x, x, x has unit norm. If x doesn't have unit norm, then I think what's the, there's a usual trick, which is um, I think you send, you basically, you, you have to make some assumption about x. So you have to, you have to assume that its, it's norm is bounded. And, and, yeah, like in the, let's say the norm is bounded by 1 or b or whatever. And then what you do is you just kind of um, pad x by having one extra coordinate that has kind of the remaining mass to make it to make it on the sphere of this ball, and then send that. I think that's that's the usual trick. Right? Any intuition why you need to rescale w if x is already in it? Why? Because it's not going to change the privacy guarantee. Why would you need to rescale w? Oh, why does why do you need a, a, a uh, why is it not already unbiased? Is that the question? You're just returning w. So. Um. I think alpha will at least depend on p, but um, maybe something more than one. Right? What is alpha going to be something? More I don't. Than I don't remember offhand. To be honest with you, yeah. Let's take that off. I don't remember. 
Um, but yeah, so this rejection sampling thing with the, the PRG, it's good. The communication is low because you're only sending a seed. But because you know this rejection sampling thing, you might have to sample a lot of times before you actually find something that satisfies the condition for this, for, for if you're in case one. Uh, so that makes the device runtime slower. So can you get? So the question is, can you get both low communication as if you were using a PRG with a small seed, and fast device time, like linear or something? Uh, yeah, linear, simultaneously. Uh, and there was some progress by Chen, Kairuz, and Osgur, uh, which relies on caution representations. Uh, let me actually just say a little bit. Well, actually, I, I think I can, I can skip this, but what I, maybe what I'll just say is, um, I'll, just jump to, I'll just jump to what that gave you. So if you look at this uh, CKO paper, this, so this is the SQKR. It got really low communication, epsilon, where epsilon is your privacy loss parameter. Um, your utility loss is, again, like last time, there was, you know, instead of four times, it was eight times or 36 times. They lost a constant factor in their utility loss. But the device time was actually nearly linear, d times log squared d. Compared to priv unit, priv unit has much worse communication, optimal utility loss, good device time. So the real problem was the communication. So in, in, in our thing, proj unit, proj stands for projection. Our communication, we lose some log factors, but it's like O tilde of epsilon. We lose a one plus little of one term, but we're opt. And our device time is also actually even faster than the SQKR. It's instead of d log squared d, it's d log d. And the algorithm is super simple. Uh, it's based on random projections. That's why we call it proj unit. So you pick a random projection matrix pi, like a JL kind of matrix that maps your d-dimensional problem into a k-dimensional problem, where k is something that's like epsilon or epsilon log d. You compute x tilde, uh, which is pi times x. And then you normalize x tilde to have unit norm. And then you send that using priv unit. Right? So you're, run, you're running priv unit over a lower, lower dimensional version of the problem. Right? So if you look at what was the problem with priv unit, the problem with priv unit was your communication dependent on the dimension. But now the dimension is epsilon. Roughly. So this is going to be a low communication step. And then what you send to the server, you send u hat. Uh, and you also send um, uh, pi to the server. OK, or like the, the, the seed that was used to generate pi. OK. Um, right. And this pi can be like a fast JL matrix. And the theorem is that um, proj unit has error at most. The error, so priv unit dn is if I had run priv unit in the d-dimensional space with my n devices, we know that this is the optimal error. So our error is that optimal error times, you know, times 1 plus something small, which is little of 1, uh, plus an additive term. And there's, you know, we also can do some stuff to get rid of the additive term. Um, and if you get rid of the additive term, basically we, can, we have another Similar algorithm that basically gets you this. OK. And I think I'm, I have only two minutes left. Um, so, oh. One quick yeah. So, OK. So, actually, the, the right thing to do uh, to get kind of the best result is that, uh, a, well, it's a slightly different model. But the best thing to do is that everyone uses the same JL matrix. So meaning the server picks the JL matrix. It could be pseudo-random. And then just sends everyone, like, this is the seed for the JL matrix. Everyone use the same JL matrix. Um, yes. OK, yeah, so um, good. Uh, maybe I'll just, I think, yeah, that's all I really wanted to say. So I'll just stop here and take questions. <laughs>